section. Uh, so I'm talking about distal radius fractures. This is a case, this was uh, several years ago, actually maybe 15 years ago. One of the senior residents in cardiac surgery fell playing soccer with other residents. And he was brought to the emergency room with the other residents with his hand and wrist quite crooked. And what you can see is the um, displaced Collie's type fracture with a little bit of an intraarticular extension. And the question is now what to do? The residents are asking what to do. Should we just take him to the OR and fix it immediately? Or should we try closed reduction in the ER? Well, they did a reduction and I would argue that they got a very nice reduction. And uh, that's the AP and here's the lateral x-ray. So pretty good parameters. Now the question is, is that an adequate reduction? And I would argue that it is. Will it hold? Well, that's something that we'll talk about. And does he need to be fixed? So what we decided to do was to treat it non-operatively. He was okay with that. And it ended up healing with just a slight amount of shortening, but overall very good alignment. And he's now the chief of one of the cardiac surgery programs in the city. No problems with that risk at all. So when it comes to disradius fractures, broadly, you can fix pretty much every single one of them if you're so inclined, or if the reduction is good and it's not a Barton's type fracture, you could potentially watch it and then fix the ones that go bad. Disradius fractures are 10% of all fractures, the most common fracture of the upper extremity and more common in young and older age groups. The normal anatomy of the radius on the AP film is an inclination of the radial uh, surface of about 23 degrees and an ulnar variance of about neutral. On a lateral film, there's a palmar tilt normally of about 10 to 12 degrees. Now it's important to always x-ray the opposite wrist because people don't always follow those normal guidelines. The AOS has reduction guidelines and those are an acceptable reduction is less than 10 degrees of dorsal tilt, less than 10 degree loss of radial inclination angle, which would put it at about 13 or 12 degrees, and less than three millimeters of shortening of the radius, and not much of an intraarticular step off at all. Now, the AOS could not recommend for or against operative fixation if you were old, like me, over age 55. And there is no need for early wrist motion, okay, but finger motion needs to begin immediately. And no type of surgical fixation has proven superior. Now, if you're older, people say, well, maybe you don't need to have these fixed so much. There's lower demands. Who cares if you get arthritis if you're 92? You may have medical comorbidities. But one very important factor is that older people may have friends who have broken their wrist and they don't like the way their friend's wrists look. So you, meet, you need to tell them that it may look a little crooked. And if they're not okay with that, then they're going to need to have surgery to fix that. Because although Collies in 1814 wrote that while the limb is gonna be great at some point in the future, the deformity will remain undiminished through life if it's a very displaced fracture. And that's what the deformity looks like. It's a short radius and a, and a prominent ulna. Now, there are several studies showing that in older people, they do pretty well with uh, non-anatomic treatment. This is a study from uh, New York, a joint disease showing that at about a year out, despite fracture malunion and somewhat diminished grip strength, the older patients who were treated non-operatively had equal scores to those who had surgery. This is a, a well-known study in JBJS uh, from Austria comparing bowler locking plates to non-operative treatment in people over 65. And while the grip strength was better in the operatively treated group, no other parameter seemed to correlate. And, the, and their results were essentially equal at one year post-op, post-injury. This is a large population study of about uh, 14,000 patients from the Mayo Clinic recently published in JBJS. And they found that in patients who were treated operatively, Compared to non-operatively, stiffness was about twice as frequent one year following the injury. So the real life problem is the patient comes in to your office with a nicely reduced but potentially unstable fracture. They say that the uh, emergency room 
staff reduced it twice and they were really happy with the final reduction. So they come in and you take an x-ray and it looks pretty good. So the question is if it were to heal like this, it would probably be okay. But the problem is it may not hold. And as the healing goes on, the fracture may settle and collapse. And the reason why that happens is if we use this styrofoam cup as a metaphor for your distal radius and you're about to break it and here you go, you crush it, you fall off your mountain bike and crush your radius. Now you go to the ER and they pull that radius out to length. And so on the left side, that's your AP film and the right side is your lateral film with the dorsal side to your left. And you have gaps in the fracture site, which are potentially areas where the fracture could settle back down. And then as you start moving your fingers, which is very important to do, the fracture can little by little settle back down again until sometimes it ends up almost as bad as it was to begin with, with non-operative treatment. Now we do know that some fractures will not hold with the cast, such as articular shear fractures. Those are the volar and dorsal Barton fractures and your radial styloid fractures. And that is because you can pull all you want on this as soon as you let go, the fracture is going to redisplace proximally. What else is unstable? Well, fractures that are extensively comminuted or you're reducing them and it feels crunchy and it just doesn't seem to want to hold or if the bone is old and soft. And there was an article by LaFontaine which got a lot of press in the 1980s about which fractures tended to be unstable. And the ones that seem to be unstable are if there was an initial dorsal tilt of greater than 20 degrees, dorsal comminution, intraarticular fracture, associated ulnar fracture, styloid fracture, or if they were older over age 60, if you had three or more on the initial pre-reduction x-ray, they tended to redisplace. So to sum that up, when you have a perfect reduction with a non-Barton's type fracture, you can either observe it and they have to come back every week and a half or so, and if you catch it, then it needs to be fixed if that's what you've decided to do. And if they make it three and a half to four weeks, they're gonna stay. Uh, they don't usually go out of place after three weeks. Or you can fix it even if it's well reduced, and that is to ensure that it stays in place. And the reason to do that is because they don't have to keep coming back to the office every week. And the surgery is easier than if it displaces three weeks out. The disadvantages of surgery, of course, there are some complications, which are rare, but do occur. Now, the question is what kind of surgery to do? Traditionally, in the past, K-wires and casting was performed, and that's not done too commonly, although sometimes it is. External fixation had a big heyday in the 80s and 90s, not used so much anymore. And now it's mostly plates and combinations of other things. Now, plates and screws are basically always required for the articular shear fractures in order to buttress the articular surface. And many use them preferentially for all types of fractures. Uh, the question of the volar locking plate versus the external fixator for extra articular fractures is one that can be debated, but I think the war has already been won by the side of the volar locking plate. We did a prospective randomized study at Columbia several years ago comparing the volar lock plate to a radial column plate or external fixation. And by a year out, even at six months, uh, the results were the same. But of course, the ones that start moving earlier with a volar locking plate have earlier, better results, but not better long-term results. Now, plates do have some disadvantages. Sometimes the screws end up in the joint, so it's important to check an angled view on the fluoro to make sure that they're not in the joint. The screws can irritate the tendons, in particular the FPL and the EPL. And the previous uh, plates, such as the PI plates that were placed dorsally, irritated the extensor tendons, but nowadays the newer plate designs really don't do that. And the plate alone is not a guarantee of healing the fracture or holding the reduction. So you have to watch out that your screws are not in the joint and you have to be careful that you don't lose fixation of the volar ulnar corner because that can be a problem and the fracture can resubluxate around the plate. The Soong index, uh, Maximilian Soong described this basically uh, to uh, point out the fact that a palmerly applied plate that's too palmer can erode into your flexor tendons and may cause a late FPL rupture. So you try to keep your palmer plate 
as close to the bone as possible. If you don't, such as over here, there's a little, it's, it's not totally reduced. There's a, 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 a prominent screw. You can rupture your FPL requiring a graft or a tenon transfer. This is another plate, an older version, and this one also eroded through the FPL and required a, a graft. Now, EPL rupture can be seen with a bowler lock plate when the screws are too long, and it's sometimes difficult to tell if they're too long. And you can get different views of the uh, radius trying to see whether it's penetrated dorsally, but it's kind of hard to tell. So the best way not to have that happen is to just go 75% of the way across the distal row of screws. So you just drill the unicortical, and then you can depth gauge off the dorsal cortex and you put the screws in. And they're usually not longer than 18 millimeters. If you're putting in a 24 millimeter screw, that's probably way too long. Now EPL rupture can also be seen with non-displaced distal radius fractures. And if that happens, uh, the most common procedure to treat it is an EIP to EPL tendon transfer. So they like to ask on the in-service exams about tendon ruptures. So EPL rupture, as I said, can be seen with non-displaced fractures or with prominent volar dorsal screws and the treatment is an EIP to EPL transfer. The FPL ruptures on prominent volar hardware and can be treated either with an intercalary tendon graft or a tendon transfer, usually of the ring FDS to the flexor pollicis longus. External fixation is still a useful technique. It maintains the length of the fracture and neutralizes finger flexion forces, but it's usually not used as the sole fixation technique, more as a supplemental technique. Now, if you pull straight out on your hand, you are not going to be able to restore palmar tilt of the radius. Distraction of the carpus does not uh, restore that. The only thing that can do that with an external fixator is pushing down on the hand. In other words, translating the lunate palmarly. That can improve the tilt of the radius. So if you translate the hand down as you're tightening up the X-fix, that rotates the lunate somewhat palmarly and can rotate the radius articular surface into more of a palmar tilt. Now, why do people's fingers get stiff? The external fixators had a, had a sort of a bad name from finger stiffness, but it's very simple. The patients did not move their fingers because if they did move the fingers, they would not get stiff. And that was me, 1983, with an external fixator on from uh, a little accident. And it is possible to make a full fist with an external fixator quite nicely. Now, the X-fix can also be used for salvaging failures of volar lock plates. So uh, it's used in addition to putting a new plate on. So if the volar lunate facet escapes around the plate and you have to redo the surgery, as in this case, you can go back in and replate it. And then you put an external fixator on and just create a slight dorsal moment with the hand to try to uh, prevent that carpus from resublux resubluxating palmarly. And that can give you a little peace of mind uh, post-op, so when they come back to the office, you're not dreading the x-ray and wondering if that's going to show that it's resubluxed again. Now, a dorsal spanning plate is an internal external fixator that can be used for unstable radiocarpal joints or smashed radius fractures. You typically leave it in for three months. Be careful of the way you slide it in because sometimes you can slide it on top of the EDC tendons and that will cause a rupture. It does not automatically correct the fracture so that you may have to do other plates in order to get the fracture fragments back together again. Now, what about the ulnar styloid? Well, fractures at the ulnar styloid base theoretically destabilize the distal radial ulnar joint because that is the major attachment of the TFCC, which itself is the main stabilizer of the DRUJ. So if you have an ulnar styloid base fracture like this, you would think that the DRUJ would be unstable. However, the answer is, is that the ulnar styloid does not need routine fixation in the setting of volar lock plating. What you do is you put the plate on the radius and then you assess the stability of the ulna by shucking it, holding the radius and the hand together, shuck the ulna. And if it's stable, then it does not need to be fixed. That is the ulnar styloid does not need to be fixed. If it is unstable, then the ulnar styloid can be fixed. And that can be done with a small incision over the styloid and put a K-wire and a tension band technique. There's something called the distal oblique bundle of the interosseous membrane that's been described in the last few years. And if present, if it is present, that can restore DRUJ stability if the radius is out to length because it runs in this direction. So if you get the radius out to length, it stabilizes the ulna 
And that can explain why the DRUJ is stable, even with an ulnar styloid base fracture. Three other points. One is that push-ups usually need to be done on your knuckles if you've broken your wrist in any way. I don't recommend doing them on a hardwood floor though. Two is that it may take six months to turn your hand all the way palm up. Supination can be very difficult to regain and sometimes just takes time. And lastly, it does hurt usually on the owner's side of the wrist for quite a while after a fracture. So don't run in three months and do something to the TFCC because they're still complaining of pain on the owner's side of the wrist. That is quite common. Other questions that they ask about, vitamin C a few years ago, 500 milligrams a day was recommended for prevention of CRPS or RSD, but that has now largely been debunked. There was an article that routine, routine hand therapy, like everyone goes to hand therapy is unnecessary. Uh, and that is probably true for wrist motion, but it is mandatory to go to therapy, I think, if your fingers get stiff early on. Because if your fingers get stiff early on and they're not able to make a full fist right away, they may come back in a year and this is still the fist that they can make. And they, and they are never gonna be able to make a fist. So they have to go to therapy, I think, if they cannot make a full fist very quickly after the fracture. The other thing is check for osteoporosis because a lot of these older patients have osteoporosis. Now, let's review some quick questions. What happened here, the uh, lunate is now palmer and with the plate on, you see the screws are loose. The answer is that the plate did not adequately capture the volar lunate facet of the radius. Here's a question, a man goes, uh, undergoes an ORIF. The surgery was uncomplicated. When the block wears off, the patient has dense numbness and a florid carpal tunnel syndrome. And what are you gonna do here? Well, the answer, is not to loosen all the dressings and come back in a week or get a nerve conduction a test or explore the plexus. The answer is to do a carpal tunnel release. This is a 50 year old man who had a wrist injury in a, in a motorcycle accident and the uh, fracture is stabilized. And after you do that, there is no instability of the DRUJ even though there is an ulnar styloid fracture. So management should include fixation of the radius and that's it. If the DRUJ is stable, you don't have to fix the ulnar styloid. This is a CT of a 45 year old woman who injured her wrist after a fall. You can see that there's a little tiny fleck and that's the uh, insertion of the volar wrist ligaments. So what are you gonna do for this? You're gonna fix that and make sure that you fix that volar fragment. This is a uh, really a Galeazzi type fracture and the most appropriate treatment for a Galeazzi type fracture is fixation of the radius followed by intraoperative evaluation of the DRUJ. Again, fix the radius first and then evaluate the DRUJ. This is a 42-year-old woman treated with a cast for a minimally displaced fracture, and all of a sudden she cannot extend her thumb. That's an EPL rupture. The most appropriate next step would be usually an EIP to EPL tendon transfer. Fixation failure of the, of the distal radius fracture and associated volar subluxation of the carpus can happen when you have the volar ulnar piece. That needs to be fixed. A validated predictor for redisplacement of fractures following closed reduction, that's from the LaFontaine criteria, that's patient age. A couple more, when attempting to recreate the inclination of the distal radius during fixation, use of intraop floor imaging in this position is helpful in showing the answer is the intraarticular screw penetration from your volar plate. This is a 35 year old man who has a badly displaced fracture 18 hours later, he comes back to the ER with worsening pain and numbness. The forearm is soft. Note that his wrist is only in five degrees of flexion. So there's no sense in changing the sugar tongue and putting the wrist into a different position. This is a florid carpal tunnel syndrome and you wanna basically just uh, repair the fracture and do a carpal tunnel release. Uh, during a closed reduction, the best uh, maneuver in order to reduce the volar tilt would be Volar translation of the lunate, as we talked about with the X-fix. This is a patient who cannot actively extend her thumb after a plating of the radius. The best treatment, again, would be an EIP to EPL transfer. Uh, an 82-year-old woman with osteoporosis falls. She's casted. She can now do everything, but she has an obvious wrist deformity. She can move all her fingers. The best treatment would be don't treat the fracture X-ray, Treat the patient, the patient's doing well. So observation is the best treatment for her. 
Thank you very much. And now I've heard Dr. Posner's talk several times over the years at this course, and every time I learn something new. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Martin.